Welcome back to another episode of Money Talks. This is Hugh Meyer. Hope you're doing well. Remember, we are connecting successful entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and business executives to deliver actionable advice to you, the small business owner and entrepreneur. Today, we are super excited to interview Matt Wensing. Matt is the CEO and founder of Summit, a brand new startup delivering a financial modeling tool to small businesses. In this episode, we discuss Matt's background as a serial entrepreneur, the foundation and formation of Summit, the process behind Summit and how it can dramatically help improve your financial modeling, and the democratization of fintech. We hope you enjoy this episode. Matt, welcome to the Money Talks podcast. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, super excited to have you here today. Really appreciate your time. Looking forward to learning more about yourself and, and your team. So uh, with that, maybe give us a little bit about your background. Sure. I uh, second. I, I would say second time founder, but this is my this is like my fourth idea that I've worked on, um, and uh, kind of came out of college with a computer science and design background, right around two thousand and four ish. So, I uh, it's right around the time you know Web two point was a big deal, okay. and people were starting a lot of early early Web two point companies. So yeah, friends, friends uh, were starting these startups and everything, and uh, I was really interested in it, but I, I hadn't started a business yet. I went and joined a company as a software developer for a few years, and then I started my first company in 2006, um, and uh, that business was acquired in 2019, so it was a really long road <laughs> of uh, 13 years from kind of like the first lines of code to an exit. Um, and then I had this idea for another business while I was running the first one, which was, you know, financial modeling in a spreadsheet is is way harder than it seems like it should be, right. and and yet it's this really valuable thing. And so my my big idea was, okay, it's really valuable. How do we help people do it more often and better? And that's the premise of Summit. That's great. Thank you for that. Maybe unpack a little about you know your first going through your first startup and maybe talk a little bit about what you learned, you know, mm. from building that up and then exiting and then going yeah. into summit. Yeah. Um I think I mean, it's it's <laughs> it's a lot, right? It's uh it was my first um you know, as a kid, I was like, I was the one trying to sell like little magazines that I had written and, you know, uh, going door to door with chocolate bars and all that stuff. So it's not like it was my first time trying to make money. Um, I actually like to share it. It's funny. I, I was an Amazon book reseller online in like 1997. <laughs> so I was like 15 or 16 years old. I'm not even sure if I was supposed to have an account. You know, maybe I used my parents' information, but I got my first online paycheck that was stamped with Jeff Bezos <laughs> signature. And it was like 25 bucks for commission sales on books on the internet. And I just remember going, that's a, like, I made this money and all I had to do was build the website. And it, it, it just, it just ran, you know, I was, it was like the coolest feeling. Right. Um, and so I, when I graduated college and, and went out to work, uh, I think I just never lost that desire to right. like build a, build a thing, build a machine that makes money and is somehow separated from the day-to-day, -day, you know, um, labors, if you will. So yeah, I, I started that and, and I, I would say like topically, I just learned a lot about fundraising. It took me over a hundred pitches to raise money for that first wow. business. Right. It was brutal. <laughs> it was taught me a lot about how the world really works in terms of venture funding and angel investing and angel, you know, and, um, friends and family rounds, all of that. Um, and, you know, what do you sort of not learn uh, about team and culture? And then wh what I learned relevant to Summit, which is the new business, was, again, we were evolving the business really rapidly. We started out at the really the low end of our market, and we ended up doing enterprise sales, um, traveling around the country, you know, doing pitches and demos. And those are very different businesses in terms of their capital requirements and, you know, their sales cycles. So I remember looking at our financial model on a given day and not being able to answer questions from investors or from myself around, you're evolving this business pretty quickly. Your model is you know, telling you this, but it's kind of already out of date, like it's obsolete in a way because <laughs> you're still figuring out your business, right? And, and I think that's something I learned or recently is in the early stages, your business is evolving so rapidly 
that it's sort of like no wonder your financial model can't sort of <laughs> stay in t- stay in right. tune, keep up exactly because you're outgrowing. It's like a, it's like a toddler with shoes. You know, you're sort of like <laughs> you're like buying new ones every every two months because it, it, it they've just growing up and um and so it's, it's interesting. A lot of a lot of the I think a lot of the financial practices and accounting practices were really designed and evolved around kind of um, businesses that didn't have these kinds of trajectories, these kinds of like high growth trajectories, rapid evolution, pivots, all these things. It was like, okay, you know, you're a restaurant, you're a, you're a shoe business, you're whatever. Here's, here's how you manage your books and your finances. And now these startups come along and they need something very different, you know, it's right. in, in terms of adaptability and agility and, um, and evolving with the business that puts a lot of strain on like a CFO function on a finance department to even try to meet those needs as quickly as they develop. Right. And then you, then you add on Latin, you know, other thing I learned is that's just the CFO and finance function is not a hire that most people even think to make in the early stages. Right. Right. It's delayed usually until you realize you have to have it, <laughs> and then and then they inherit a bunch of mess, and right. they have to you know, and then you end up investing a fortune or at least the first certain months of their entire time with you, sort of just to clean out the closet and the skeletons and the bugs and everything else, and, and realize like okay, you know, let's let's actually build a system for the first right. time. So I think I learned that too is that you know, it, it kind of this um, cruel irony a lot of the value that's provided by a, a really great finance function is unavailable to an early stage company who actually really could benefit from that right. capability, right? It's like the ability to f- predict and forecast and manage cash and all these financial, you know, again, capabilities. Those are things you really want to have early, but it, it's just a much harder area to, to have it right, to take control and really to be able to do it. So I kind of learned that there was this huge, um, unmet need in, in the sense of in the early stages, you're winging it when that's exactly when you would really benefit from right. more discipline, <laughs> you know? No question. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate those anecdotes, especially always the, one of the common threads from from interviewing founders on the podcast is I always love those stories. You know, they were entrepreneurs from day one. You know, yeah. it wasn't. It wasn't <laughs> it's not something. It's it's not something that you just kind of fall. You can't fall into it. You kind of have that spirit about you, and then obviously yeah. it evolves. Uh, that's a great anecdote about the Amazon. That was when yeah. they just sold books. I, I love that story. Oh but, yeah, uh, yeah. But but to your point that this is you know this is something that you know this that evolves over time and then oh, yeah. you know bringing it back to what you're just talking about with summit it is it's amazing you know and this is why I love doing these podcasts is because you're introducing such an important resource to these founders that mm. wouldn't have have had access to that but need like you said they need it really from the jump. Um, that yeah. can hopefully, you know, stave off any issues that they, they might have to en- count encounter down the road. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a, it's a very, um, you know, bootstrapping and right. uh, sort of survival bias and, and trial by fire and, and all these things. We, we kind of, there's, there's a harshness to, <laughs> to like trying to start your own business yeah. that is just sort of expected. But if you flip it around, you know, then you realize like, wait a minute, the, you know, these, these businesses are kind of infants in, in a sense <laughs> who, who need the most kind of uh, help and nurturing and, you know, discipline, if you will, to get started on the right footing. And what, what happens in reality most of the time is you're kind of just like, you're just trying to survive in the wild, right? You're just like, you know, you don't, you don't have like some, some, you know, wing to just park yourself under and until you can, <laughs> until you can figure things out, you're like, okay, I have to survive. And so what you do is you, you cut corners operationally. I think it's really easy to cut corners at the beginning, not because you have some bad habits, but more like if this isn't, you know, on fire, if this isn't going to, you know, kill me today, right? I just kind of need to, need to not prioritize it right now. Right. So I think the access part is only solved when you can lower the cost dramatically. 
right? To lower both the cost in terms of time and money. And I think that's that's sort of why it's it's um it's sort of part of of, of this whole system, right? It's like right. when you have a lot of time and money, you can afford these luxuries, which are actually maybe shouldn't be luxuries. You know, it's like it's like things you really need need it all along, but you can sort of finally uh, have access to them. But in the early days, you know, I, I was there. We we bootstrapped for the first five years of that first business out of those thirteen. The first five years, we didn't raise any money, and man, unless it was a unless it was an urgent and important thing, right. you just weren't gonna you just weren't gonna think about how much money is in the bank account. Was about as far as <laughs> <it's> about <laughs> as far as I got, you know, on most days. So um, I've lived it. I get it. But I think to your point, the innovation I'm trying to bring is really make it super accessible and super fast and inexpensive, right? So that you can reach the right. entirety of the market, right? Yeah. Yeah, I love that. That's why I, you know, I love talking to the founders, especially in the fintech space, which is, just, which is where I've spent a lot of time interviewing in the last few months because you, you, know, you guys all have this amazing spirit and you're, you know, you're all about really creating efficiencies for, for all these startups and these entrepreneurs and these, and these small business owners that just didn't exist. And it's great to expose them. And, I, and the other common theme I'm finding is it's this concept of like democratizing. Like, I feel like mm. it's a big change that's happening right now. I'm seeing it in finance where mm. it's, it's more about, you know, how can we make this available? Obviously you need to, you know, support your business and, and make a living, but the, this idea of making this affordable to others and and really almost democratizing what you're working on. Yeah, yeah, I I'd, I'd like to run with that for a second because Please. I've thought of, I've thought about uh, what really like to summit specifically. So it's a financial modeling tool, and the idea is you know you can sit down at a spreadsheet or you can sit down at Summit, which is you know a spreadsheet like environment. And I actually have learned that. Uh, founders, especially entrepreneurs, um, people that can start businesses, I I believe that they are gifted modelers because they're gifted visionaries and conceptually they get things and see things and predict things that like a lot of people don't, they just don't want to, they don't bother, it's just not natural, whatever it is. So, so they actually have this talent, but then you sit them in front of a spreadsheet, which is like, Rows, columns, you know, and boxes, and and they kind of, they kind of freeze up mm-hmm. where they're like, okay, um, I guess the first row is re- is like how much money I make, and then it, and then and somebody comes along like, well, actually, you know, if, if it's revenue, it's not the same thing as you know your sales income for the month, and is this a cash basis accounting or accrual based account? Okay. And suddenly, like they can't, suddenly this this gifted modeler, right, sort of they're naturally gifted kind of feels like they just can't do it right. Right. Like it's, it's um, this is now, now they're getting sort of slapped on the wrist for doing it wrong when they have barely just gotten started, but it's because we've got this like accounting practice that's sort of there. It's established. It's been around for hundreds of years, literally. And they're coming to it just going like, Oh yeah, I've got a, I've got a sales pipeline and a funnel and I do this thing on this website and they're not, what what's happening is they're not speaking the same language, right? Like they're modeling, but they're doing it in a way that's really about, they're just, they just want to describe their business, right? So they can model in that sense, but they can't model in a sense of like correct accounting terms and, and calculations. So what I'm really trying to do with summit is say, okay, you've got a talent. (laughs) You're really good at, what ifs, scenarios, thinking about the future, shouldn't you be able to just describe your business and get a sort of a, a pro forma forecast right. for it without having to worry about revenue recognition or, you know, bookings versus that? Like a lot of this stuff is, um, it's after the fact uh, calculations that you do on transactions, on, on books, but a founder that's trying to model stuff, they just want to say like, hey, if I raise my prices, uh, how's that going to affect my my profitability? It, and sort of like let something else take care of all of the, the you know, terminology and the, and, and the, de- the details in that sense. So I, I think what I'm trying to say is like, I think part of the 
accessibility problem or giving, right. you know, bestowing these abilities to others. It's like they have this innate ability, but the only tools available to them are tools that are made for people from a totally different discipline. Right. And so then they freeze up and they're like, okay, well, th this isn't for me. <laughs> and meanwhile, it's like you give them a whiteboard and a marker and they'll like model the next five years, you know? Uh, that's, ta that's, that's clearly a talent for modeling and forecasting and prediction. So what I'm trying to do is say like, how do we get that ability and translate it into financial terms, right? Because if we can do that, then it's going to be natural, right? And I think that's always the aha moment is when a founder goes, oh, I can, I can forecast. I just needed something else to take care of all of the, uh, the formulas, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you for that. Yeah, that, that actually would lead me to my next, you know, you're already going into my next thought question, <laughs> talking about just from a high level, you know, the process involved when you sit down with a client or a prospect and discussing mm -hmm. kind of what your the process is for, for change and, and for learning more about what you guys do, that's going to obviously help them. Yeah. So we, um, I've just recently started using a tool uh, to help with this, to, to kind of take the, you know, I'm the, I'm, I was a solo founder, so I was onboarding folks myself and just document, speaking of, you know, discipline and operations, like just started documenting, you know, what's the, what's the one through five that they need to complete, you know, and then underneath, underneath each of those, there's other things or other steps that you need to complete to really get onboarded. And for that, I think with a forecast, one thing to understand right away is what is your intent? What's your, what's the value you seek to get out of this forecast? For some people, it's operational, like we've been talking about. For others, this is transactional, right? It's like there's another party that needs a forecast or needs something. And you're really trying to just build a spec and say, I'm trying to do a, a four nine a valuation for my stock or for my company. They expect a revenue forecast, you know, for that. Or I'm doing a fundraise, right? And my in, these investors I'm pitching need a forecast. That's one thing, and that can kind of be done in isolation, more the traditional way of just going into a conference room, if you will, or a virtual conference room, filling out some assumptions and numbers, running a forecast, sort of printing it out, if you will, and then giving it to the recipient. What I'm really building our business off of more is the operational part, um, which is really done. It's still done pretty ad hoc for most people. It's I've got a board meeting. I've got an annual team meeting where I've got to talk about the numbers for 2021. <laughs> and I'm not really sure <laughs> if this goal is realistic. Um, we also plan to hire some folks this year. I'm telling the team that. I don't know if that's realistic. And so usually into these conversations, people who want something operational, they're not coming with like, oh, this other party asked me for something. It's on the inside, I'm starting to get to the point where I'm not sure that I know what I'm doing <laughs> in terms of in terms of projecting my business. And, you know, it's a really um honest reflection at that point of, yeah, we've gotten to the point where what I can do with a spreadsheet and no outside help, I've outgrown that basically. Um, and so what I typically do is I say, hey, can you, can you send me your financial model that you have today? Funny enough, the most common response to that is uh, a little bit of, of, I like to say sheepishness, let's say, but it, almost like embarrassment. <laughs> of like, I'm like, oh, you know, you uh, you don't want to look at that. And and it's funny because I came into this business thinking, oh man, you know, I, I, here I am coming out with this tool. I'm going to try to replace their existing financial model with it, with a more of a, um, a software product. They're going to be like really clinging on to right. their existing, their existing tool, right. Or, or the existing thing. I found that it's not, obviously it's because the people are coming to so there's selection bias there, but even people who are relatively mature, they're kind of happy. Uh, they're willing to leave behind <laughs> sort of their their current best practice, right? Their current internal best practice, and say, you know, let's um let's just start let's just start from scratch, right? And and see. And so we go through and we say, okay, you want to start with let's start with a budget, right? right? Baseline expenses, current expenses. Just extrapolate that out with some with some modest increases. Then let's talk about existing revenue, and I'll. Say, 
existing revenue for a subscription business is one of the most overlooked or glossed over pieces with a spreadsheet approach. And it's because uh, revenue subscription based businesses, of course, have retention, retention curves, churn. And I will say I've, I've, I've not seen a single spreadsheet yet that does cohort based revenue retention correctly. Right now, some of them are in the right direction. They might be, a, you know, a, you know, a mile down the road. Right. But they always stop short because if you think about this, you're like, okay, I've got two years of customers in the system. Some signed up last month. Some signed up 24 months ago. I know we like to talk about. I'm just going to pick on. I'm going to go in the weeds for a second, just to give you an example of what we do Please. during onboarding. We're trying to help people really understand something like. I know that you as the CEO are seeing 4%, 6%, 8% churn month over month of your top line revenue. But you got to understand most of that is coming from customers you acquired last month, a little bit less from customers you acquired three months ago. The least amount of that churn is coming from customers you acquired 12 months ago. And like, okay, yeah, that makes sense because they've kind of made it through it's sticky, right? They're sticking around. There's right. this long there's this there's this long-term loyal to customer loyalty. But if you don't get that part right, like if you don't do the, I kind of look at it as like a layer cake or like, if you ever been to like the Grand Canyon, you know, you see like the layers of, of rock <laughs> there. If you don't see those cohorts, those bands of revenue correctly, then your forecast is actually going to be wrong. You're sort of starting out of the block incorrect, right? right? Because, because real churn, if you took a SaaS business, it's kind of a fun exercise to do in a model, but if you took a SaaS business, let's say, and you turned off new customer revenue tomorrow, so no new customers, and you just let it coast, the shape of that revenue decrease would follow kind of that retention curve, right? It would sort of deflate like a balloon. You just mm-hmm. sort of sinks down like one of those bounce houses being deflated in your backyard. <laughs> but yeah. and, and so it kind of has this like gradual, gradual deflation to it. But if you take something like 8% right churn month over month, and you apply that, which is what a lot of basic models do in a spreadsheet, it ends up following like this, uh, you end up going to zero, right? And and you end up going like down this 45 degree angle, right? Which is like churn, churn, churn. That's not that's not how a business churns without new revenue. So I a lot of what I do at the beginning is say, have you ever seen retention by customer segment? By, by subscription plan before, by month of sign up before. And a lot of people have never seen, you know, the fact of, wow, we're retaining customers that subscribe to the silver plan, like 10% more in the long run than customers who subscribe to the bronze plan. And what does that tell us, right? And, and you know, that's like the first sort of light bulb moments people right. have of going, Wow, doing it in a spreadsheet where I wouldn't have teased out, you know, 36 months of churn by plan by customer. Uh, I just never would have done it. it. Was kind of setting me up for failure in the first place. We kind of do that, establish a foundation, and then we do all of the um, then we do all the new customer revenue and acquisition on top of that. So I kind of the last piece is, okay, what is your uh, what are your future funnels and acquisition channels for revenue look like? And, you know, we can actually set up a system where you can see this many leads at the top of the funnel, these conversion rates. And what's really fun about Summit is we can split those converted customers into those different subscription plans or free trial or buckets just with the click of a toggle, right? So it's like, oh yeah, we got 150 leads a month, 20% of them sign up for the bronze plan, 30% for the silver plan. We just set those percentages and then we run this model and actually out of that model comes that pro forma forecast of revenue over time, expenses over time, uh, ARPU over time, you know, all of those, that spreadsheet view. But what we're doing is we're giving the founder a tool or the executive team a tool to just say, just tell me everything there is to know about your business, right? right. And, and we'll, we'll generate the financial statements, right? The, the financial statements should be generated off of the business model, right? Not create a financial statement while you got the business model kind of rattling around in your head, right? <laughs> that, that's that's really really hard, right? So, 
So um, our, our real belief is if we can capture the business model and, and that structure, you can generate financial statements all day, right? And, and that's what Summit does actually at its core. Uh, thank you for that, Matt. That was a, a great uh, description of you know what you guys are doing from you know from minute one, and the value proposition is it, it's crystal clear. I mean, you really are when you're coming in there, really showing showing that prospective client, you know how this is really going to alter their thinking and change their thinking, and really, you know, uncom- maybe uncomplicated. That's a you know what's going on and un- un- really unpack it, but yet show it to them in a way that's really meaningful. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll hinge off the democratization piece real quick or that follow that theme. Yes, it's true. Democratizing it to the leadership team, to the CEO, perhaps, or the, you know, others that aren't the CFO or finance team. But think about the product manager who is thinking about how do I prioritize these five new, new feature requests? That product manager has an innate sense for the business and can say, I think this feature will improve retention. I think this feature will grow, you know, uh, account sizes. Right. I think this feature will attract new, you know, will improve conversion rates because it's an integration and these customers won't buy right now because we don't integrate with this CRM, right? So they've got this these uh, assumptions or thoughts around what these features are worth to the business in a very abstract sense. What Summit can do or what a tool like this can do is say, you don't have to go to the CFO and say, hey, run me three scenarios or nine scenarios that say, hey, if we release this feature, what's the impact? Release this feature, what's the... that's never going to happen. But giving them a tool where they can come in, copy a model with a click, change the conversion rate, hit go, and get that new revenue number. You know, Now you can go into a sprint planning meeting or even a, a quarterly meeting or a board meeting or a annual meeting going, we think we know what these features are impact on the top line and bottom line is going to be right. We've economically evaluated these, uh, this roadmap, not just, well, we know our users are going to love it. Like, that's great. But like in what way, (laughs) right. And, and does it matter if you do this feature first or this feature second or this feature third? Cause maybe if you do them in this order, you know, your revenue will do one thing or your, your business will do one thing. If you do them in this order, they'll do another. And I don't think that rigorous sort of like the financial rigor has made it into a lot of other sort of smaller decisions that take place inside the business. It's sort of, we've got this much time to build these things and do these things, but we're not really testing those things against a financial model in any way, you know, um, other than to say, we know it's our most requested feature. We we should probably do this one because it's going to have a big impact, but how we quantify the impact, you know, um, unless you're Coca-Cola or something like that, you probably haven't, you know, <laughs> um, quantified the impact of those things because it's just too much work. You know, um, y- you can't set aside a day or two days or three days every time you need to make a prioritization decision, right? Uh, but if we can have that take 10 minutes, 20 minutes, okay, you know, let's actually look at that because we're about to spend a month of engineering time on something, spending 10 or 20 minutes to know what the best possible ROI is going to be. That's that's actually worth it now, right? We can we can invest in that exercise and figure out that oh wow, even if we knock it out of the park, this feature is only going to grow our revenue by three percent because it only applies to this small set of customers. They they're loyal customers already. You know, you can actually start to see these things, right? Um, and that's what I'm really excited about. Is like what happens when financial modeling. Is- available to everybody, every, right. every leader at the company, you know, not just the C-suite. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a, that's an excellent point and really super important and look forward to more and more people listening into this and realizing that how, how important that is on each level uh, at the company, like you said, not just at the C-suite, maybe talk a little briefly. Obviously we're trying to forget 2020 as much as possible, but obviously sure kind of how did that impact because you were mentioning earlier how you were you know you were going all over the place obviously you're trying to grow your company how did that impact what you guys were working on make changes that maybe you made just talk a little bit about that sure yeah i'll, I'll provide like a little 2021 perspective on it um you know at the time and, and you know we didn't know what the you know what the impact what the 
how are we going to recover from this? Right. Nobody really knew. And I still, they'll think in some sectors, we're still figuring it out. So, you know, we did the best, we guessed the best we could with the information we had. I will say for our business, what's been interesting is it's not that people, you know, (laughs) let's say there's a crisis, uh, your house is on fire and now you call the police department or the, the fire department and they come and put it out. Like, Usually then you're not like, oh, okay, you know, upgrading my fire alarm system or whatever like that. That's, you know, you, you have to literally deal with the problem, right? And, and that's what I think a lot of people had to do is just triage, fix, recover, get out of this thing in one piece or, you know, as much as whole as we can. Lately, last couple months, especially like maybe November, December with the annual planning, January, February, getting back into the saddle, if you will, and like figuring out the year. I have heard of more than a few people say like, you know, yeah, we kind of learned last year that we weren't as good at forecast. Like we need to have better tools for forecasting. It wasn't that our tool wasn't doing the job until then, but it was, it taught us that when something like that ha- happens, not being able to turn any knobs or dials on our model easily was, was a problem. Like we, you know, Hey, what's this impact going to be? Oh, well, you know, the impact is going to be these customers that are restaurants, like these restaurant customers of ours, they're probably going to put all their accounts into hibernation, right? If you don't have a financial model that lets you simulate that, you're kind of like, okay, well, that let's dig through and figure out who's in that group and then how many do we need? It? And then how, did they sign, did these restaurant co- customers sign up last month or recently? Like to really figure out, you know, what the impact's going to be for you is just at that point, you just kind of throw your hands in the air and say, okay, we're going to guess. Some people come out of situations like that and they just kind of go back to, what they did before because I survived. So, you know, I guess it worked. Other folks came out of it and said, yeah, I really wished we had had a better tool at the time. And I'm not going to wait for another situation. And I think it's, you know, it's kind of a good wake up call that we need to do something else. I'll say one other anecdote that's, that's interesting out of this was some businesses had the opposite impact. A lot of remote first or distributed assistance, you know, like, collaboration tools, uh, productivity tools that are geared towards remote. I mean, Zoom is the k- killer example, but there's others. They saw a huge surge, right? Yeah. And so their CEOs and leadership are sitting down you know, now and going, what's my, what's my growth forecast going to be for 2021? But I can't use 2020 <laughs> because we're not going to have a pandemic I, I hope not, you know, but like, but like they're actually skewed in the wrong direction that right. way. It's kind of funny, you know, and so I, you know, we do machine learning modeling uh, at Summit as well. And you'll see these big jumps for some of them back in um, February, March of last year. And I kind of have to say, okay, you know, we need to downward adjust for that and say, you're on this path, but you're not going to have another February, March like you did last year. So, you know, before you go tell your team, oh, we're going to grow 80% this year. Just remember like maybe 20 or 30%, whatever percentage of that was because of a once in a whatever event. <laughs> and so you kind of get, you, you can get hurt in that direction too. Um, right. And I will say over promising and under delivering is like the thing that, you know, we, we feel a lot of emotional pain around as, as leaders. So, you know, just something to keep in mind, you know, make sure you understand like what really drove your growth last year. <laughs> um, and you know, where are you going to end up? So, so those are some anecdotes sort of more like 12 months later, Right. What are people saying? Right. Thank you. Yeah, pre- appreciate that. Again, you know, I uh, really amazing job throughout this. And as far as insights and really providing great actionable advice to, to all founders, I always give my guests uh, a second because I ask them so many questions. I want to <laughs> turn the, turn it and give the mic to the, to the guests and see if they have any questions they'd like to ask me. Yeah. Um, well, I, I would say, uh, what is your, what <laughs> what are your goals for the year? I, I'm, oh. I, I'm, I, yeah, it, it's still early enough that I think um, I, I like to ask this question and I'll throw out there. I, I started a forecasting challenge for my users of the product just to say like, hey, let's see who can be accurate with their forecast. I'm not going to put you in the spot and say what's like a revenue forecast or something like that. But um, yeah, are you a goal sort of goal setter type? And- 100%. Yeah. Yeah. No, I have not been asked that question. So thank you. So there's two parts to that. The first, the, I, I, this year I actually divided it into two pieces. One being, you know, just my business, my first business, if you will, which is helping my partners and I run our, our, our wealth management practice. So mm-hmm. I set, you know, kind of definable goals as far as, you know, you know, retention and raising revenue, et cetera. 
Um, cool. and, and doing more, the, the one thing we really want to continue doing is a lot of planning. We, we, we had done quite a bit of it last year, um, kind of extensively, which was, which was somewhat fortuitous in, in the yeah. sense that, you know, obviously in many cases, things froze up last year. And, and that was the impetus and the genesis of this podcast, which is there was so much information at the time and in many ways still is flying out at business owners, entrepreneurs, et cetera. And it was too hard to figure it out and it was very overwhelming. And so what I wanted to do with people like yourself and, and, and other colleagues is really figure out a way to disseminate that information, talk about how they could be a resource and how this is this piece of, of what they're working on can be helpful to them. So that leads me to the second portion, which is the podcast itself. So I needed to create, I've created goals for the podcast, which is, you know, continuing obviously to interview more and more founders of, you know, in the FinTech space that are really doing, they're doing things differently and they're, and, and changing, they're changing the world. And they all have this, this, this significant understanding that, we're in this digital world now. We we and or we're or we've been fast forwarded into it. It already been kind of created under our feet, but we're leaving the analog world and we're moving into the digital world. And I want to kind of connect with people that understand that and can explain and, and relate to people and say, this is kind of where we were, this is where we're going, and this is how you need to think about this, and this is what we've done, and this is how we're planning. So that's part two, I guess, of my goal is, is you know, to continue the outreach, if you will, continue yeah. to put out pieces of content that I think are helpful to others and continue to be a resource. I love it. I love it. Yeah, that that um, the why now question in, in fintech, uh, it has so many answers, but it's converged. <laughs> the convergence right now is uh, is incredible. And you think about something like Stripe, you know, year, yeah. you know years ago, but um, it, it, even since then. The APIs that are available, yes. the uh, in, information that's available, I think it means we can all, I think the next wave of companies in this space are essentially uh, in fintech as a community is really these higher order problems of, you know, it's not just arithmetic and addition and subtraction and figuring out formulas uh, in a spreadsheet. And it's also not, hey, how do I get the data? We, we now have this awesome opportunity to go, wow, with all of this for the the first time so much of this at our fingertips in one place there are transactions and things that haven't even been touched by technology yet in, in terms of the way they're done today in this economy of 2021 you're going you know if you ever buy buying a home selling a home uh so many things that we do as people where the process is still like it's, it feels like it's from a different generation, like it, multiple generations ago. <laughs> yes, Ar archa archaic is a, is maybe a kind term at this point. Yeah, it's it's not it's not from it's not from the it's it's barely from the '90s. Maybe put it that way. Um, I think in fintech there is this leap that's going to happen, or that's happening, where there are some countries and places that maybe you know I, somebody told me about taught me this about India, but like there wasn't a lot of landline. So in terms of telecom infrastructure that got implemented there, they kind of went straight to cell phones. Right. <laughs> and it, whereas in America, we kind of had this gradual, you know, landlines, then telephones or then cell phones and so forth. I feel like fintech in, in a financial space is going to leap over almost yes. the 2000s and the 2010s and go into a completely new generation from a very old generation. It's, it's more of a leap than a stair step. I, I, I 100 percent agree. I mean, anecdotally, just from talking to the founders that I've talked to, who are all have been in fintech in different pieces. There's no question. I mean, it's happening, and there's other you know, people I hope to interview as well. And I, you know, it's one of my favorite spaces to stay on top of. And there's no question, it, it is on. It's definitely on fast forward. So uh, yeah. I can definitely agree with the sentiments. As we're concluding, maybe offer. You know, you've, you've offered so many great pieces of advice and pieces of wisdom for founders. Maybe just leave us with one more piece of actionable advice. Uh, yeah, I maybe maybe, maybe I'll, sh I'll I'll shift gears a little bit. Um, I think you know this uh, this this opportunity that we we have. Maybe maybe you're working from home uh, for the first time. Maybe you've been doing it for a long time, but. One thing I've learned over the years is like listening to myself in terms of how I perform best, when I perform best, 
what routine serves my own mind the best and my body the best and just kind of pushing that farther maybe than you have before in terms of listening to yourself and uh, whether it's getting up early or exercise or, you know, maybe you work really well late at night. I don't know. I'm not one of those people, but you know, whatever it is, like, I do think that people can do awesome. You can do better work than you've ever done. If you can kind of get into a rhythm with your own sort of highs and lows. And like, if you're hitting a low at one o'clock in the afternoon, maybe just kind of go with it, <laughs> you know? And if you're hitting a high at, you know, uh, five o'clock in the morning, maybe go with it. So I don't, it's one thing that I've really learned like being an entrepreneur for so long and I actually have worked from home in a, for a long time is I'm sort of no longer ashamed of saying, look, I work super well from 5 a.m. to 11 a.m. I work okay from about one to four, 4 p.m. and onward, I'm kind of useless, you know? <laughs> and, and, and that's just... That's just me. So, um, and I've just kind of learned to accept that and say, okay, that's that's when my brain and body work best. And so, I, maybe I, the actual advice would be if you haven't found that groove, um, or, or you know, if you're holding back for any reason, maybe just uh, investigate a little further. You know, give yourself a shot to perform, you know, two x better than you than you can because you're more in tune with your body and your mind. So. That that was great. I I really love that, and I appreciate that 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 schedule. I think that's an amazing piece of advice. I'm very much the same way as far as, you know, getting started very early. Obviously, some people love to get going very early and some do not. But just having that, you know, accepting, you know, of what that schedule is and really focusing on that and, you know, getting the best out of yourself when you know you have your, your energy and when you're not taking that step back. So that, that's an amazing piece of advice. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Thanks so again, for having me, Hugh. Yeah, Matt, it's really, it was amazing to have you. I, I really appreciate your time learning more about Summit. Uh, really look forward to, you know, your continue your progress and staying on top of everything. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Hugh. Have a great day. Thank you, too. Remember, everyone, we'll be back next week with another episode of Money Talks. You can subscribe on the YouTube channel, hit the like button, and we'll be back next week. Thank you again. Take care.